thank you. So I think we're doing like a little bit of our own introductions each, chat for about five minutes, and then we will chat and see where the conversation takes us. Um, I've got some slides for my introduction because it really helps me focus. Um, so yes, I'm Laura, my pronouns are she, her. I'm co-artistic director of Stopgap Dance Company. Still quite a new um, into the role, so I'm still slightly finding my uh, way with that. Um, audio description, I'm a white female. I have brown wavy hair that I've tried to tame back today with some clips. Um, I'm usually wearing purple, today is no exception. Got a purple jumper, multicolored scarf, and various other purple things around me. <laughs> um, I'm sat in my wheelchair, and I also identify as neurodivergent. So a little bit about my journey um, to becoming co-artistic director. So I joined Stopgap in 2001 as a dancer, and that was straight out of having done my A-levels. So a lot of my, the majority of my training was basically on the job and growing alongside as the company grew. And um, so my current role within the, my area of the co-artistic directorship is uh, focusing on creative learning, talent, di talent development and advocacy. Um, so a little bit about more about Stopgap Dance Company, if you're not familiar with us. We are an inclusive contemporary dance company presenting world-class inclusive dance work. And our artistic vision is to offer a window into a parallel world where human interdependence, strength and vulnerability play out with poetic realism. So that's our artistic vision, but alongside that, we also, as in the introduction, said so Stopgap is driven by a diverse creative team who use dance as a movement for change. So we also have a social ambition going alongside our artistic vision, and that is to create an inclusive world where diversity is not just accepted, but pursued a world where no one is limited by prejudice against deaf, disabled, or neurodivergent people. So within this, uh, the area of inclusion and relevance, I, I was kind of thinking how I wanted to introduce like the areas within the company. And for me, I kind of felt it naturally split into four areas. So creation and productions, reaching a wider audience, training and development, and creative leadership and governance. So I'll just very briefly touch on those. Um, so inclusion and relevance with creative creation and production. So for us, diversity is really important. It is basically like the lifeblood of the company. Um, yeah, diversity is the lifeblood of, div of the devising process. Different perspectives, reference points, and life experience are essential in driving a process that will deliver relevant, rich narratives that new dance audiences can connect with. So it's really, we're not just an inclusive dance company because it's a nice thing to do. It's like essential to the makeup of the company and that we work with unique individuals and celebrating uniqueness rather than thinking about trying to be a carbon copy of each other. And alongside that, representing diversity on stage gives an audience a chance to reconsider both what is dance and who can dance, and to address potentially negative and narrow stereotypes they might have formed about differences. Um, so then that kind of leads on to then the audience. So we're inclusive and diverse within the company, but we also want our audiences to represent the diversity of society. So we're developing different ways to remove barriers and to make work accessible to a wider audience so it can become a universal shared experience, rather than there's certain times where you may have accessibility there, but it might be, oh, just on this evening, this is when it's audio described, or this evening is the signed performance. We want to make it all a universal experience. So we questioned, what if dance was more than just a visual experience? What if music and spoken word were more than just auditory experience? How can we make that crossover? And we're particularly working with this with our current new production, which is called Lived Fiction. And it's embedding creative access in the process rather than as a bolt-on at the end. And this does take time. 
and investment, um, but also really importantly, consulting with those with lived experience is integral to actually making it meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Tarek El Mutuakil. I didn't come with any prep. That's normally a condition for me speaking, um, is that I prefer to speak from the heart um, because I feel like with ADHD, I can't always rely on being able to even remember what I've written in my notes. So ideally things just kind of like come out here, but I normally also don't speak to anyone before 11 a.m. So <laughs> let's see how this goes. Um, all right, so I think, um, oh, I should do um, a description of myself, shouldn't I? So I am a brown person, man, I've got a little beard thing going on. Um, I have lots of accessories, silver, amazir, like the North African jewelry, a lot of it, my own culture. Um, and um, I've got a shaved head. It's also building, but shaved. Um, a fluffy purple jumper and some pleated green um, pleather trousers. Look at those. Um, so that's, that's a bit about me. Um, no, okay, so I actually think that one of the nice, one thing that I like to share with people is my creative journey, my journey into the arts because um, I feel like that can be useful. And I didn't plan to be in the arts per se. Um, not, I didn't just, just fall into it, but I, let's, let's just do the story. So um, in 2001, I moved to Brighton for university, studied psychology. I didn't know that I had hearing loss at the time. And I also didn't know that I had ADHD. Um, so I did a degree, found it really difficult, persevered, um, managed to get through, decided to stay in Brighton and I was got a job in a pub. Uh, at the time it was like a little lesbian pub called the Marlborough Pub and Theatre. Um, so I started working there in 2001 and with not any particular ambition, just to like, I just want to be happy in life. Um, and yeah, in 2008 I went, I rejoined the festival circuit just you know, working in a, in a hippie cafe at Glastonbury Festival was the first one I did that summer. And I met loads of people who were making things happen. And I was like, I wonder if I can make things happen. I wish I was the kind of person who could do that. And then I thought, well, I'm not gonna know unless I try. And by the end of that summer, well, at the very first festival, I decided that I would put on one event in the theater above the pub. And I was like, wow, I'm gonna put on this event. It was steampunk, but it was like 2008. So it was, it was cool, all right? <laughs> Um, so I just had a steampunk cabaret in mind and was going to produce this whole event with, with other artists that I was meeting. And by the end of the summer, I decided that I would just take over the theatre. I saw an opportunity where I knew that the theatre would be empty. I knew that the theatre would be empty. And I thought, maybe I can just start doing things up there. I knew the building well. I had experience in the Marlborough, the, the pub, and I thought maybe that is something that I can bring. I also had been there for quite a few years and seen it changed hands a number of times. So I kind of knew, I had an idea about what not to do as well. Um, and even though I didn't have a theatre background, I thought, I'll just take over a theatre. What could go wrong? <laughs> um, lots could go wrong. <laughs> but actually, it didn't, I don't think. So I came with an idea, collectively with a group of people, we had this idea for this thing called Brownton Abbey, which was an Afrofuturistic space church themed performance party that centers, <laughs> celebrates, and elevates disabled queer people of color. Um, it was amazing, and it really kind of like, it, it, it was a tool, a creative tool that helped me connect with other um, people who, who I'd been told didn't exist in Brighton or that I would be hard to find a community. And that was, I think, a catalyst for me to, um, to use arts and the resources to bring together the people that were otherwise struggling to be together and like thrive. Um, so yeah, that's my, been partly my journey, 
Marble Productions over time has like grown and grown and we do quite a lot of work that's all about uh, communities um, leading their own stories. Uh, definitely something that occurred to us was that as um, diversity became more popular, there were a lot of people who were trying to do stories about other people who were more diverse than them and that was something that we were not, that's not really good phrasing, more diverse than them, but you know what I mean. Um, um, yeah, so yeah, people having control and ownership of their own stories is something that I think is very important to us. I think that's enough of an intro from me. Um, and let's hand over to Ricky. Um, so I am a kind of medium brown <laughs> black person with a uh, Blonde dreadlocks, blonde and brown dreadlocks that go down to my chest, over my shoulders. Um, I'm wearing lots of brown and orange today. Uh, <laughs> and um, what else? I think I, that says it. Uh, that kind of that's what it says, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, and I have been uh, creating art since. Well, I'm like everybody else, really. I started out knowing I was an artist. Every child comes into this world thinking they can do whatever they want and they always think they can make art and they don't have to have any sense of judgment on themselves they just make their pictures they tell their stories they put on little plays they, they you know I, i'm you know, driving the bus driving the ambulance mummies and daddies doctors and nurses all of that they just do it all without any fear they're not looking for reviewers they're not looking for critiques <laughs> They're, right, they're not looking for assessments. They, ju right, they just get on with it, and they do it, and they do it with absolutely no apology and um, no permission. And um, and then quickly, things start to come in, like, oh, you're gonna, can you get an award for this? Can you get a certificate for this? Which is great, till you don't get a certificate for it, and you don't get an award for it. And before you used to bring your own awards home and say, you know, to your parents, can you put this on the fridge? And, uh, and, th and there it was, you just, you had your gallery, you had your dramas, you had your theatre, you, you found your costumes and you put on your shows and, and you lived your best life. And then it becomes a whole kind of series of things that you're allowed to, oh, boys are supposed to do this and girls are supposed to do that and they're supposed to think this and they're supposed to think that. And the whole thing starts to cave in. Um, I was, um, I just, my, my mum came from Jamaica when she was um, 12 and by the time she was 16, she was pregnant with me. And, um, and she was, my mum's a lesbian and she was still working all of that out as well. And um, so she really wanted to empower me. And so she, she um, saw that I like, I, as soon as I could speak, I, I was looking at letters and thinking, what are these? And so she taught me to read um, when I was three. And, um, and from then on, I knew I wanted to write. And, um, and she was thrilled that I was wanted to, to that I was getting on with words because she had to change her accent with everybody she met. She, you know, an immigrant girl. And I was somebody who just was so comfortable um, with words and with the language. And so she immediately encouraged that. And I decided I wanted to be a writer. And nobody told me at that point I couldn't. And then when I was about seven, um, I decided I wanted to be a playwright. And then the messages started to come back. There are no black playwrights. There were no black actors. I was born in 61. So I'm, I've decided to be a writer in 64. And, and, in, and in 68, I've decided I want to be a playwright. And uh, that, now, when you put it that way, suddenly you realize, OK, what was going on there? And for me, I was going on. I was getting this done. And so um, that was how I started to work with other creatives. I would write plays for people. So I cast my plays first and then I write for the people who are in the play. Not to represent them like they're autobiographically. I may make them transform themselves or encourage them towards that. So sometimes it's like, um, so it's like I'm designing a, a fashion show and I think, well, Naomi would look amazing as a Greek goddess. She's never going to walk down the street like that, but she's comfortable on the runway in that. And that's how I work with actors. Sometimes they're wearing they're kind of wearing the character that they are, and sometimes they're wearing something 
um, miles away from them that they're excited to explore. And that has been really the ethos of my whole uh, cre career and my creativity. Um, I had a whole period where I started to wonder if I was ever gonna get a foothold in the industry because um, people, people kept saying, you're too gay, you know, you're too black, you're too this, you're too that, you're too this. And, um, and I started to think, well, I, you know, how do you do the headshots and get an agent and all of those things. And then uh, I hit a point where I realized that I was right in the very beginning and that I should just make my work my way and, um, and I should encourage other people to do the same. And that doesn't matter how conventional and headshotty and they are and how radical and out there they are, the, um, that they're all welcome at the table and that they all have a place in the world and they all have something to say. They all have a face worth seeing, a voice worth hearing and a story worth telling. And that has led to fantastic experience for me as an artist, um, as a choreographer, as a, as a, of course I'm very diverse, as a creative too, and I can encourage that in other people who are constantly being told, stay in your lane, this is what you're meant to do. And, um, the, uh, and also it's helped me become a mentor, which um, for me I would die if I couldn't create something every day of my life. But the, the, my second passion, um, and it's almost a twin passion, I guess just one was born a few seconds before the other, is to encourage other people to make the art that they want to make in the way they want to make it um, and connect with the wider world as best they can, but most importantly, connect with themselves. So I mentor writers and directors and, and um, many, many actors and producers and dancers and choreographers and so on and so on and so on, musicians. And, um, the, um, and every single person I work with, the, um, it, it frees me, it teaches me, and um, so I still feel like I'm seven years old, writing my first play, even though I'm, I don't know what it is now, my 50th. And so, um, so really I'm here to encourage that in all of us in this room, that complete and utter freedom that you are uh, whatever you, uh, kind of artist you want to be, and that you have a face worth seeing, a voice worth hearing, a story worth telling, and you're not too black, you're not too white, you're not too fat, you're not too thin, you're not too tall, you're not too short, you're not too rich, you're not too poor, you're not too gay, you're not too straight, you're not too middle class, you're not too working class, you're not too anything except too brainwashed to realize just how beautiful you are. And so that's it. And it seems to me that you've had similar journeys really right um is um when you're creating the dance pieces is what's the what is the the kind of spark that galvanizes all that for you um i think it's it's the people so i think it's like it's very similar to what you were saying that it's um who is in the room who um the the individuals and the diversity and drawing on their their experiences and their like the way that they are I think is really important and then how we can take the differences celebrate the differences but kind of find cohesion amongst that diversity and find like a commonality within the diversity and I think that's yeah that's kind of where the interesting spark comes from yeah and the, um, so that's the whole idea is that each person you make the most of whoever each person is whilst creating mm. something that has unity to it. Yeah, yeah, and I think that kind of then, that's like the, it's the you know, said you know almost said so many times, but that that when then the sum of the parts, that the sum of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That kind of like taking those and actually really investing in each individual part to make the whole um, much richer. Do you feel like that there's a lot of loneliness that you're having to? To, um, to heal in the performers and the creatives that you're working with? Or do they come to you feeling quite confident already? Or? Hmm, interesting. I think there's, um, there's definitely challenges within like the, um, the training sector, like having, having the or people having the opportunities to get invested in before coming to us. Right. So there's so many other barriers 
that are in the way of like getting that same investment that so many other people can have and maybe take for granted within their kind of developing their journey. It's interesting that you were like, well, there's a difference there that you were like, yes, I knew I wanted to be creative. And I think I knew from quite a young age that I wanted to be a dancer. Um, and in a way, luckily for me, I think, I'm not sure if that's, um, but I knew I wanted to be a dancer before I had my injury. So I came through as a, um, a child, a young person, I came through mainstream training. And then I had my injury and was like, oh, but all I, all I want to do is be a dancer. I don't know what else I want to do. Um, and so I've been aware then of had that maybe happened at a different time, I wouldn't have had that same investment and same opportunities as a young person to ignite right. that um, passion for creativity. So then I'm quite now passionate about trying to create those opportunities for others. Do you mind me asking, how, how old were you when you had the injury? 16. So I just started doing A-levels, doing A-level dance. So I was like, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do dance. Oh, right, need to rethink that. But then was very lucky that the tutors that I had at college um, supported me to come back and continue to train. But if I hadn't had that, I don't know where I would be now. So you're trying to make sure that other people have those channels? Yes, yeah. Yeah, which is, it's interesting, something I think we also kind of discussed when we had our chat before, was like the extra um, responsibility that we have. Like when you are in a minority, you've not just got the responsibility of doing your own stuff, but also trying to create opportunities for others to kind of support that, you know, to increase the voices. Yeah. That maybe that's not necessarily a pressure for mm. mainstream organizations or artists i, I say mainstream I like with that. quotes i like that but not it's not for everybody but for mm. those you know i love that but it that being it's seen as other and othered by people made me compassionate towards all kinds of people i i feel like it's a superpower but but mm. that shouldn't be a requirement it's got to be for the right people because Tarek, you were saying i was really interested when you were saying that you basically you skated over it real fast but you were like i suddenly had a, you it's like you were it was all going it was happening it was happening and then suddenly you just had a you said a breakdown was that because you felt outside or, or out, othered or lonely because i'm I, I feel like a lot of people are lonely yeah i felt like i was different and I also didn't know how to articulate that or want to draw attention to it or like say that I just, I, you know, I, didn't, I, I didn't know myself in, as a disabled person at that time. I was wearing hearing aids. I didn't get my hearing aids until I was in my mid, I think in my mid twenties, I was living with a family who were like, we think you've got hearing loss. And then when I was 28, I finally got the hearing aids. And then I think it was only by the time I was 35, because I, I used to be, I'm just, a, you know, my ears that aren't very good or just don't, you know, I blame, I didn't understand myself as a disabled person and it was really liberating to go, oh yeah, I have a disability. It was quite, it was quite a relief actually. What did you think before? Did you just think, I'm, I'm just not got it together? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> and you know, I wasn't like listening properly or I wasn't very, maybe uh, I wasn't like as interested or something. And maybe that's also how ADHD connects because I would, you know, focus a lot more when the, when the interest is there. So, so I felt like it was all just, you know, it's my own fault. Or I also just didn't see oh, that wow. this sort of, the, the because I can wear, I can not wear hearing aids and still follow along. So I kind of just didn't understand that it was a disability. I think maybe I had a different idea about what disability is. And I think a lot of people um, experience that as well. I meet loads of people with hearing loss who don't wear hearing aids and I really like to advocate for them to be like, you know, you can hear birds singing when you put these in. Have you realized that you don't hear birds? You can also hear people. That's, that's quite nice too. Uh, um. <laughs> I, did, I did like that when I, without, without the hearing aids, if I didn't hear something, I would like just assume that someone had said something nice, for example. Um, but yeah, there was a thing around feeling, I think, feeling lonely and just different. And when I, when I said, uh, when I used to say living in Brighton, like, uh, I would see other people of colour sometimes together. And I would assume that 
other people of color knew each other and hung out together and that they was just like, and I, it was my, I hadn't got it together if I didn't know other people of color in, in the very white city of Brighton. And at some point I kind of like challenged that and was like, oh, maybe that's the, the opportunities for us to be together are actually hard. In the, in the space that I lived and worked in, in the Marlborough, for example, I found that when black and brown people came together in this queer space, it felt like that was like a magnet to people to kind of want to be part of this cool moment. And so it actually made it hard for us to be together in public, which also led me to want to do things that were, I, I, lo I loved, I love inclusivity. And I also love a little bit of exclusivity and we'll, we'll come to that. But yeah, absolutely. I had a, a coming back to your, to your question. Uh, I, I think a breakdown of just about feeling just like, I don't know, am I a fraud or am I like, I don't really know the things that other people know. But then at some point I realized that I know other things and they're really useful and I can bring them to the table and be really proud about my own journey, the things I know, the people that I know, the connections that I've made, the way that I see the world. Uh, you know, difference is, is, a, is a power. And rather than like feeling like I should be the same as other people, you know, I kind of, I knew that in other, in other parts of my life, but if I, I think in the world of art, for some reason I felt like I should know, I should be able to re replicate what other people are doing. And it was the moment when I went, ah, oh, can do what I do and bring that and I encourage other people to do what they do and we all bring our own all of the parts of ourselves the holes of ourselves as well because there was also a point in which I realized that I'd have to be like queer in queer spaces and leave the disabled and brown parts of myself elsewhere oh wow and that moment when you start to realize oh actually I want to have all of my parts all together I can bring all of me to any space I'm in yeah and that's quite hard to find actually I think everyone struggles with that yeah, I agree. I think being feeling like a whole, a whole human being where we haven't got to hide parts of ourselves can be, you know, it can be a bit of a vulnerable thing, can't it? Yeah, I think the, yeah the idea of, as well that the being a whole human and sometimes like what you need, whether access needs or you know wh whatever to make you be be able to be the best that you can is remembering that some of these things it's just it's like human access requirements you know maybe you need something for you for that day that it's not necessarily related to like what a protected characteristic but it's just what you need as a human to be able to thrive and every human needs something that's specific to them so, yeah so there's no such thing as a disabled requirement there's a human requirement yeah. Oh. And I think so many things when you start, I've certainly discovered with um, some of the like um, artist labs that I've been leading is like we start by just making a, an access agreement. So it's separate to an access rider. We can come on to those as well. Um, but like that actually everyone in the space has an opportunity to safely express kind of what they need to feel safe and to be able to get the most from that space and sometimes you know it's very human things like I've got you know some little people who are depending on me so I need to have my phone on because I'm an emergency contact sometimes it's just like you know I, I need to be able to step out of the space and not feel judged for not being um, you know engaging with it the whole time because I need that space and these things to just to verbalize them and give people the opportunity to feel that it's okay and they're not going to be judged for these things. And I think that's a very universal... How do you, how do you though, how do you... This is a... a I'm going to get into trouble <laughs> for this question, but I'm going to ask it because people are thinking it. How do you stop people taking the piss? Because it's some people have... <laughs> some people, you know, have requirements and yeah. some people have, I just want it. <laughs> it's not been... A, interestingly, it's not been an issue in if... if anything the issue has been the other way around that people are so surprised about uh, being asked their needs they're like well i don't know how to articulate what i need because i've not been asked wow yes yes <laughs> i uh, every time i i um, um, do meetings with actors i always say to them well what would you like to play and they never know because mm -hmm. no one ever asks them that they're supposed to just is that whatever job's going just like be, you know desperate for it as opposed to having an, a creative agenda that they can centralize whilst being open to other things. And often I ask people um, on the first day of rehearsals or whatever, or workshops or whatever, what do you need to do your best work? And again, they'll think, 
they, they, it sometimes takes them a week to come back with the answer because they've never been asked and they've never thought they had the right to ask themselves that. Is that what mm. you're talking about? Yeah, I think so, definitely. That and to kind of make it more of a commonplace thing and also that to not feel like, um, and I think it's particularly more so with um, freelance artists and independent artists that also uh, they may get asked, but they then don't want to be a troublemaker right. or they don't want to, you know, feel, you know, that they're being awkward and they're not going to be asked back because, well, they asked for that. And that was a bit unreasonable when actually it's not. So I think there is it's a conversation that we've been having that actually there is a responsibility for everyone just to ask no matter what, whether you think someone might have access needs or not, whatever it is, ask. And like, if people get used to asking, if people get used to being asked, then we can just all be a lot more open and talk about it and not feel um, pressured about, oh, is, is it going to be accepted if I ask for these things? Is that then, oh, are we frightened of that because, oh, we're going to say no more disabled people? Or, you know, that just don't invite any black people and then they won't mention racism because yeah. they won't be here. <laughs> they're just, they're too <laughs> fussy, you know, we just don't want to deal with that. Yeah, maybe that is a, yeah, I think that's a valid fear. I think that's a valid fear. And I think as also, if you're marginalised in multiple ways, obviously that's going to happen even more so. So you might only bring a little bit of what your needs are. I also think it takes quite a lot of work to figure out what your needs are. And it's an ongoing process and that changes. And I think people forget that that your needs change over time and we have to keep checking in with ourselves and like feeling our feelings. That's a tough one, I think. Um, you know, it's, that, it's some vulnerable work and it takes, it takes some confidence, which is why it's really, I think, important also to, enco to also encourage people to, to share their needs. A lot of the time, we know, we, 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 we will ask people for access riders um, but actually, we now we work with people to create an access rider, and we remind people that it is a a live document, so it's something that can be continually added to. Because I think that I have a certain amount of needs, and later on, I'm always discovering new things that I actually I need. Like just before this, we had these bright lights up here, and we were sat here for a little while. I could have sat for an extra half an hour with bright lights in my face, and just accepted it, and. It's, it's because of thinking about access that I'll actually voice, oh, can we just turn the lights down? And of course people can turn the lights down. But in the past, I might not have done that. I might have just suffered through it. And I think there's a thing that I think there's an expectation is that it, we should suffer. Is it because, because vulnerability keeps getting mentioned, is it because we're worried that vulnerability means we're weak? I think so. It sounds like it, doesn't it? It's that word that sounds like it's a weak word. But it's still hard because you were, forgive me for telling on you, Tarek. But we were talking earlier, because you did, that was amazing when you said that about the lights. So simple and so easy. And um, the, uh, but the, but you were saying last night, your hotel room smelled of poo. It smelled <laughs> of poo, my hotel. And I didn't want to make a fuss about it. Right. We were talking about why don't we want to so make tired. a fuss? I was tired and I didn't want to make a fuss, but you're absolutely right. And I, felt I, I was on my own and I didn't feel that I had that I couldn't pull the energy together to advocate for myself. You know, sometimes as community is really helpful because we help each other, we help advocate. And I do remember thinking like, I wish there was a WhatsApp group for us actually, then I might mention the room and someone else might go, oh yeah, just do, and there probably actually was someone that I could have reached out to, to be fair to the organizers, but I just didn't have the, met the capacity. I was tired out from the so journey. So ideally a hotel would call your room and say, is anything okay? there? Which they, yeah, exactly. <laughs> They did tell me when I checked in, if there's any problems I can say, and I was aware of that. And I just kept telling myself, I'll probably be all right. I'll get to sleep. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And then I went out at midnight. I, I was like, oh, I feel like I'm sleeping in a sewer. <laughs> I don't want to bring this energy tomorrow. Um, so, so, I made some, so I did ask for some, for some, for some change. But yeah, just a reminder to keep... It can be really hard to advocate for yourself. Yeah, why? Those are the hard... Why? I don't know. What, do you find it hard to advocate for yourself? Yes. Some, I, the, the immediate answer is no. <laughs> right? The immediate answer is I find it... I do not find it hard to advocate for myself. I'm very, very independent. But that, that very statement, I'm very, very independent, is a way of not asking for things for people, from people. Right? 
It's uh, look at me, the brave samurai on my own, getting it done, gay, black, doing it. You know, as opposed to, you know what? <laughs> Help, you know. It's, so, so I think I do. I, I think I do struggle with it more than I think I do. Because my thing is I help other people. I remember uh, I remember um, had a long time bo boyfriend and, and, um, and I remember when I first met him, he said, oh, you love looking after people, don't you? Who looks after you? And I thought, I look after me, but you know. And so, it's, so I think that we, we all struggle with this in various different ways. And so it helps if we, because I have had, had a big argument with a friend recently who's been very, I think, I think badly behaved. But I suddenly realised I just need to call this person more or text them more and say, how are you doing? And so I, every beginning of every week I, I do that. And it's really changed the way they interact with me. And so I guess that's it. Just asking people, how are you doing? And asking yourself, how are you doing? And, um, and, and encouraging other people to ask you, how are you doing? How are you doing today? It's a great question. I'm just also what you were saying was making me think about a culture of interdependence. I think we're going. You know, the West is very much like we're a solo individual being, and we we focus on on who we are as an individual and not about who we are as a community. Right. How are we independent? Interdependent. What is the kind of environmental relationship between all of us? Um, oh yes, because if I'm if if I. I'm always saying, if, I'm always saying to myself, make sure you're all right, so you can contribute to other people well. But we have to. It's all. It's everything. Is everybody all right? How? If everybody else is all right, I'm better. If I'm better, everyone else is all right. So it's a it's a whole helix kind of thing, isn't it? Rather than separate. You know, uh, this is okay. That's okay. Is we are we okay? So I really should be when I'm saying to my friend, are you? How are you doing? The question I should be asking in my mind at least is, how are we doing? Absolutely. And yeah, how are we doing? How are you doing? How am I doing? How's it doing? How's it all doing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my mind is blowing. Do, do, I mean, how are we doing? And do we, <laughs> you're doing good? You're doing good? And do you have any, do we have any questions? Um. Tarek, could you just say a bit more about, you said you're going to come back to it and you never did, and I'm a bit fascinated about you saying um, that you really liked moments of exclusivity and about the tension between the two. Yeah. Um, so I guess I mentioned before about being kind of the festival world. That was a big kind of, I, you did, I, liked, I like festivals, like summer festivals. So there's the principles of radical inclusivity that Burning Man uses, Burning Man, yeah, some uh, about things about it, but also some amazing things about the kind of like radical self-reliance, which also take us away from radical interdependence. But um, I did remember once hearing a talk, I've never actually been to Burning Man, I've been to some European versions of the kind of these same type of festivals. Um, and I remember hearing once someone talking about radical exclusion. My first, it was, it was a straight white man talking about it, and so I, I instantly was a little bit, well, my hackles were up a little bit, but actually he was talking some sense. There was a good reminder um, that, you, that people can share knowledge that might not even necessarily, he, he might not have needed to make some radical exclusive, exclusive space for himself, but he was talking about an important concept that um, I'm glad that I listened to, because let's face it. since then, but Straight white men are the best at radical exclusion. I mean, yeah, I and guess they know Pat about is an it. expert. I mean, why not listen? That's yeah, an true, expert. true. Yeah, he knew what he was talking about and the value, the, the benefits of it, I guess. But um, that helped me kind of articulate why I need sometimes to make spaces that were so. For example, Brownton Abbey, I realised that I wanted to do something that was for disabled queer people of colour because there are not many opportunities for disabled people. There are also less opportunities for disabled queer people and even less opportunities for disabled queer people of colour and you can keep adding more marginalisations to that. And it's gonna be, it's, there's gonna be less opportunities. I realised that if I wanted to make the space for us, I had to be quite firm about it because otherwise 
it would people I knew that if you know we would go to we take Brands Abbey to a new to a new location we like to work with artists from that location as well as artists coming on the tour with us and that we would ask for recommendations from the venues and that some of those recommendations people would say we don't know any brown disabled queer people I don't think there are any here um but we've got a white disabled queer person and would they could they be in it and I absolutely agree that those people need people need opportunities everyone needs opportunities but ha having the power to say this is what this is for was really helpful just to create that boundary and make the space that we desperately needed and it allows for for example there's lots of conversations that I used to not be able to have until I started to realize that I could have a radically exclusive space. I didn't really understand myself until I started to have moments when I could be with other people who had a similar experience and have a conversation that was going forwards rather than having to explain things and sort of go backwards in order to go forwards. You know, we could just keep moving forwards on this conversation. So I really felt like, oh, this has been beneficial to all the people in this room. Having a radically exclusive space for a reason is really helpful. And people understand it when, if you've got a knitting club, extreme knitters, right? I've got an extreme knitters. I only want extreme knitters to be in that group because if I've got beginners, beginners need their own opportunity, their own space. I want to be just with extreme knitters. People understand that. But for some reason, mostly when it comes around things around making a space for just people of color, that I think is when, the, when people start going, hey, that's not okay. That sounds racist to me. Um, and so that was actually quite an important step to me to say sometimes I feel like this is mostly important for marginalized groups really essentially is like you need to sometimes make spaces for ourselves and you can also make spaces that are a mix of the two for example with Brownton Abbey I like to think of the auditorium as a space for everybody That's, everyone can come enjoy when I say everybody I mean I wouldn't really want to have a homophobic, racist, ableist person in there, like, unless they're, they're also experiencing and having their minds blown and changed, but I'm not there for them to be like advocating for themselves in that moment, I guess. But so there's also some moments of things that when I think about how we include everybody, that do we really mean everybody? Um, do we want, do we want racists in the room saying, but I want to be racist. Um, Tarek, can I just thank you, an amazing answer and you know, I'm here to kind of facilitate, but there's so many things that you've raised there. And I also think sometimes it's exhausting when you're someone from the protected characteristics. It's also exhausting constantly navigating spaces. It's part replenishing sometimes to be in radically exclusive spaces. But there was a question close to the front here, and then I think there's some other questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll just really quickly say that I'm a white woman with blonde hair and a multicolored jumper. Um, and I wanted to thank you guys. Um, it's very nourishing to hear these kind of um, vulnerable, open, human and heart-led conversations being presented kind of on the stage because it gives you power and that is very um, empowering for me to hear and to sort of be part of. Um, but the question that I wanted to ask is like in witnessing these conversations is evident the time and the sort of... Um, care that it takes to kind of have those kind of conversations and the trust and the vulnerability and the challenge that I find often as a relatively early career freelance artist is how to kind of engage with with venues and sort of producers and the system of programming work and getting it made and paid for um, when these are the types of conversations and processes that I'd like to run but I'm just there knocking on the door being like, would you like to book my show, please? That kind of thing. So I think that's a real genuine challenge and I'd love to hear just any reflections and thoughts that you or anyone else who perhaps might run a building um, has to offer about that. So because I mentor all these different writers and I'm encouraging them all to be producers and to put on their plays or work with, co-produce co with uh, very qualified, very talented producers to go forward. The thing that's real, it's always been hard, but it's incredibly hard right now to get into spaces because a lot of the theatres, they're not really talking about it very much because it's embarrassing, but a lot of them are really, really up against the ropes, like really badly. They're electric running a theatre uses a lot of um, power and all the bills have gone up 500%. 500% bills that they were struggling to pay before. 
and some of them have lost their funding. So, you know, so they, they, there's all, they can't get audiences. They, they, they've had all these years where they weren't able to have shows. So there's a lot of crisis going on. And I think maybe we'll see more theatres closing, like I think it happened in Southampton early on in the pandemic. I think we may see more. So there's a lot of stress going on and a lot of can't, the bandwidth. They can't do the bandwidth. And they're closing the day and they're sitting there. If you Zoom with them, they're all wearing coats and hats because they can't turn the, the heating on so they can't host anybody. There's a lot going on. That said, um, the thing that the thing I think that we have to learn is pitching, how to pitch properly and pitch well, how to network brilliantly. People hate these words, pitching and networking, but they're actually really fun. Pitch, and we're creative, so we should have creative responses to these problems instead of um, just wishing that we could be accepted by a structure that isn't accepting us all the time. So I like the idea of making your own venues whenever possible and putting on shows in, in new spaces whenever possible um, and being creative about let's put on a show in a library, let's put on a show in a museum, approaching other spaces and being creative in our, in our front room, in a phone box. You know, I don't have many phone boxes anymore, so that's how old I am. But you get what I mean. And uh, you know what I mean? Like, where, where, how can I make this happen anyway? Because that's who I was when I was a little kid. I didn't, wasn't asking theatres to put on my plays. We used to put them on, on the, in, the, in the block, the stairwell at the, in our flats. And the kids used to sit on the steps and we'd perform. And to me, um, that's still, to me, a theatre. And do you know what I mean? I'm not saying we shouldn't be trying to get into those mainstream spaces or those accepted spaces. But I think we, if we narrow it to that, we over empower those spaces and, um, and um, we block ourselves from being the kind of people who make art anyway. And you can, I think if, if you're, when you're doing your grant form, which is another you know, circle of hell, <laughs> the, uh, if you say it, I'm putting it on, I found an old phone box because <laughs> cause I, cause there's, there's some left and this show's gonna be on in the phone box and people are gonna gather around it. You're more likely to get the grant, quite frankly. <laughs> Does that make any sense? You probably have a very different take on this. No, I would, it just made me think about um, just being on the fringes of things. Um, and basically, it maybe makes me sometimes think about a walled garden or like the people who are like the, the mainstream, maybe thinking about like uh, flowers that have been curated and put into place and thinking about like the opportunities that the wildflowers have. Who are out on the out on the fringes, growing up in the cracks, taking over, growing up over the walls and out. So yeah, there's I think there's something about like really leaning into like the power of being a wildflower. I love that. I'm not sir. sure if it's my own. I might have read it somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure I read it. I've tried to find who said something about wildflowers and I can't find it. There's lots of ugh, poetry. Um, so but it might not be my own thing. So don't quote me. It's awesome wherever. Nice it though. Goes. You're a wildflower. So you put on your grant form, I'm a motherfucking wildflower. <laughs> I mean, just thinking about yourself that way transforms the entire experience. And I think that's the most important thing for our mental health and for our creativity, is to think about yourself in a different way rather than someone who's failing at a system or struggling to get into a system. Somebody who is a system is at their own ecology and, and is offering that to others, but not dependent entirely on others. Because I'm kind of like, I like the self-reliant thing and I like the community thing. I think the two, there's a balance between the two. Does that make any sense? But I think it is getting good at marketing, which, you know, I work with these young people and they're really good with the, you know, constantly click, 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 you know, marketing themselves all the time. But, and getting good at the, the networking. And, um, and, um, and the pitching, but also just being creative about why do I have to, why do I have to, why do, why do I have to get, win those prizes? Why do I have to get those, those um, validations? How did they get there? Why can't I do the same thing? That's what I meant when I was saying, listen to straight white guys, because they, they're onto something. <laughs> Laura, did you have a reflection on the question? Um, yeah, I think something that we didn't speak about necessarily today, but we spoke in our pre-chat about was that kind of the also being aware of the self-care and that it is tiring 
constantly having to anyway just as an artist like regardless of you know be it minorities or anything as an artist i think it's tiring constantly at going and like knocking on doors and asking for you know what you need so also that kind of remembering like the bit of self-care and sometimes like picking picking your fights like if the space that you do that you think you want to work in actually is not being open to what your needs are do you want to work there find somewhere else and it's really difficult as an artist because we're so used to there not being opportunities and the opportunities are getting less um so it's really difficult to say no and it's really difficult to go okay well i'll i'll find somewhere else but sometimes yeah that remembering that yeah. that self-preservation there's a balance you can be persistent mm. whilst whilst having another avenue rather yeah. than just waiting for this somebody to pick up or answer that email or what, uh, you, you know what I mean? Sometimes you have to have the party, turn up the music and have them come and knock on your door and going, um, you're having a party, can I come to yours? Because they're, yeah. they're just, they're, it, when people who seem to be gatekeepers are always struggling with the next gate, they're struggling to get forward and go forward and get money from the Arts Council or from the lottery or from funders. They've got the same anxieties we have and it's very easy to kind of deify them and just go, that's where that's their god, and I'm this mere mortal, and I'm useless without them. They're actually having the same crises. True, indeed, true that. Um, there's a question further up, but we have Clock Chu here. Down there or me? Yes, you. Sorry. Oh. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Jonathan. I'm a Chinese guy with a ponytail and a fat hoodie. Uh, really, it's really inspiring hearing you. It's really, really amazing. Uh, my question is around sort of, uh, you've talked about radical inclusion, um, and I guess the term I've thought of is diversity within diversity. Some voices aren't seen as relevant. I can, um, I would say, like Gypsy Rona Traveller for, 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 for time, uh, the British, uh, Chinese and East Asians currently, uh, Southeast Asians too, and then white Europeans, etc. I mean, honestly, if you look at the NPO, uh, there might be one or two on the edges, nothing in the mainstream. So how can we, any thoughts on how to empower and work together and open up spaces for, um, you know, the diversity within the diversity? Oh, oh yeah. Sorry. You got, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's back to that thing of um, all the people you've listed there, I, I passionately agree that uh, they're, just, you know, they're just almost invisible. Um, but the, 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 the uh, create work. So it's really important to create work, to create bad work at first and then better work because people don't want to create work unless it's perfect straight away. And so I really struggle because I'm into all these people and it's hundreds of people and trying to, there are certain people, it's harder to get them to come into this table, so that comes to the table because they think there's no space for them. And, and the only way to do it is to create work rather than somebody commission me or somebody audition me or somebody uh, that we, uh, you know, when, when we are marginalized like that, we have to create work and we have to create unashamedly and we have to get it out there. Um, uh, and then immediately it's, it's having the party and turning the music up. It's the, uh, it's the only way um, because if you, you know, to, to keep something I keep banging on about, but they're, they're basically, when, when people, there are pe the majority people in a space, we are, they are only doing what we want to do. They are, they are creating pieces that look like them and that represent them and that they can relate to. And it's annoying so they're not including us, but the fact is they're just doing what we want to do. They're just, it, just some, just because they get to do it more doesn't mean it's wrong they're doing it. And so what we have to do is do what they're doing and then and get out there. And I know that, uh, you know, if you're not from a rich background or you're not connected, all of that, that um, that is a problem. But they're not going to just open their arms and just do it for you. That's not going to happen. So we have to create the work ourselves. We have to do it more than once. You know, you can't if you cook a meal on Monday, you can't, you know, it's not going to be there on Friday. You're going to have to cook some more meals. And so that's what we have to do as artists, but I mean, you know, 
So are you, you're East Asian? Chinese descent, you know, I, I am here for you, myself. If you want to write a play or create an opera, whatever it is you want to do, I will help you and I'll do it for free. So, the, um, so make it happen. Or if you can't do it, get your friends who can do it to do it because that's the only way. That is the only way to create the work and not wait to be asked. Not wait for permission because the only permission that counts is your own. I think that's one of the... Did you want to respond? I was going to say just more on, the, on that permission. I think that's really one of the... A lot of the time people are waiting for permission and we have to give it to ourselves. If you're waiting for someone to give it to you, that's... We, there you go. But actually, you need to... You, need to, you really need to... I think I was waiting for someone to give give me permission to recognize myself as a creative person. And people would say, oh, you're a creative person, but I'd, maybe I didn't know, can I, can I say that about myself? Does that sound vain? Um, so yeah, I think there's a thing about making that, making that start. Just start somewhere. It doesn't matter what your first step is like. Like, just then take another step, then take another step. Just keep stepping. You'll get somewhere eventually. And you don't know where it's going to be necessarily. I think there's something really big also about finding your community, helping to advocate um, for... So if you find people that... If you, if you feel that something is missing or you're disappointed that something isn't, doesn't exist, that's great. Because you can make it. You can be the There's person to the make market. it. So like, rather than seeing that as a, as a problem, it, it could also be that you might even be the solution. So much of the time, we, are, we see freedom as a problem. Like when someone dumps you and you're like, I don't want to be free. And I, actually, they've set you free. Someone fires you, they've set you free. If someone won't give you a grant, they've set you free. If someone won't, won't take you in their theatre, they've set you free. What you're doing is you're actually resisting freedom. And so the, until, until someone goes out with you, which is lovely, you're free. Right? Until somebody, until somebody has sex with you, you're free. You don't have to please anybody else. Just yourself. And so that's the thing. I, I think, you know, it's, it's about using that freedom and, um, and seeing it as that. Because it's the, the, uh, there's, there's the, the way that bullies work really efficiently is they bully you for a couple of seconds or they blank you or ignore you or exclude you for a couple of seconds. Then they rely on you to do it for the next 10 years. Bully yourself, exclude yourself. They, they rely on you to do their work for you while they're off bullying someone else. And no, not even thinking about you. So that's why you have to generate it yourself and see what see the situation you're in as freedom. Powerful, Laura. Did you want to respond? I don't think I can add any more okay, to great, that. Brilliant. <laughs> so we're going to move on. Take another question. There's two questions at the front here. Um, all I wanted to quickly add to that is in answer to the question. I think it's also about connection. Diversity within diversity means building relationships, building relationships with communities, not being afraid to say, "Look, you know, I'm really interested in connecting with you and your experience." Build a relationship. Often there's a welcome there, not suspicion. Hi. Um uh, it's an open question to all. Um, uh, where, um, where would you um, feel like is um, a good place to start in approaching access riders? And um, that could be sort of open to sort of I interpretation as an access rider, as a hum human, more than just necessarily a disability access rider. Um, but yeah. Um. Good question. I know there are there are um, resources on the internet. I know there's various places. I believe Pink Unlimited has somewhere has on in, within Shape Arts. There's definitely um, yeah information there on how to do it. And I think yeah, just kind of I suppose started giving yourself permission to think about what is it you need and kind of as we said, remembering the whole you. Um, but yeah, there are definitely there are places and resources. Also, there are some people like we um, have like a format as well that we you know there may be places that you can say, well, is there a format? Can I fill in your format? So yeah, yeah can I borrow your format and add to and, yeah. and customize it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think generally um, a lot of organisations for sure would be really happy to share their templates for an access rider. Um, so just ask, ask your local um, arts organisation, I would say. 
And if they don't want to help, that's that's a red yeah, flag that's for you. Up, isn't it? Yeah. No but access to our access. Then come right. and ask us. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send you our template. Yeah. <laughs> We've got time, I think, for one more question. Um, I apologise if I've missed every, anyone. Um, I can only see so far up, and I'm seeing the people in front of me. Hi, my name's Rachel. I'm from the English Folk Dance and Song Society. I was born in the 1960s, so I'm loving the fact that you... Yeah. Uh, medium height, perhaps small white woman <laughs> with slightly growing bob, red jumper, black trousers. Um, I just want to ask you all about allyship. Um, I absolutely loved your presentation. I feel very, very inspired. I'm very committed personally in my life and in my job to being the best possible ally that I can in the multiple um, areas you've discussed. Can you share your thoughts? How can, how can we be, we, I'm saying, as a white, straight, non-disabled woman, how can I and others of us be the best possible ally or the best po uh, possible allies to each other? So allyship, I think, is an interesting thing. I think we should all probably, we, ideally, we'd probably all be allies for people that are not like us or have to have differences, allied with, dif with difference. I generally, I don't like, I'm not like, I'm this kind of ally and that kind of ally. As an ally, I think I'd like to uh, maybe... <sighs> What I'm trying to say, I feel like we want to not insert ourselves as the ally. I think sometimes I think it's about making sure that we're supporting other people to be empowered. I think that's will be the best allyship. So sometimes allyship is about speaking up. Sometimes it's about shutting up. It's a, it's, it can be it can be a bit of both, you know. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that's allyship? So good. Yeah. Um, I was doing a, a, a project with lots of young actors and. Um, they were arguing, and one of them was saying, arguing in a healthy way and uh, debating. And um, and one of them said, um, I, "I want to be an ally in that area." And one of them went, "Well, be an ally and fuck off." And, uh, <laughs> and everyone, all of them, including the person who'd said that, fell about laughing because we got it. Like sometimes it's the way to be an ally is to get out the way. But of course, we rely so much on allies and and people, you know, and people who are inside helping people who are outside, and so on and so forth. And and we sh and but it's really about the way you. It's a gradual thing. So I know that a lot of times I get emails from people saying I arrived in London and I'm you know I'm from Italy and I don't know how to, to be an actor here. Or and everyone say, keeps saying to me, go to Ricky. And I think I'm really proud of that, that people just think, if anybody's having difficulty fitting in, Ricky will, Ricky will you know, give them a bit of tough love, basically. Get it together and uh, make your own party and all that stuff. And so, the, uh, so but, uh, but it, then I sit with a the theatre and they say, oh, what, who sends you these plays? And I explain. And they just say, oh, we only get plays from women in Chiswick who are talking about moving to the country with their kids. And I'm like, oh, well, I would, I would actually love one of those people. <laughs> But I, get, I really get the big, huge range of it, and they keep saying they get no range. And I can only decide, think it's because I make it clear that I'm there for everybody. Once you, it's, just, it's just how you do everything and how you hold yourself, isn't it? And because um, it's not like I've really said anything, you know, I've just done it. So once you've helped certain people, everyone just starts to come to you. It's, you must be finding that with your, with, with, are you not both finding that? But it, does it not go beyond even the, the kind of target groups that you were working with initially? Or is it, uh, I don't know, is it, is it just me? I'm not sure Do you not you find that, that the fact that you've been an ally to, so, to, to people in close to you, does that not, has that not permeated outside of that? Yes, and I think that might just be just how one holds oneself, and I think. I think one of the most important things, I think, of allyship is listening. Okay. That's something I just I just remembered is being able to like actually hear what someone actually actually wants. You know, sometimes people are like, "I'm here to help you," and so I've done this without actually asking Ooh. what the person. Ooh. Yeah, needs. Yeah. Well, we're out of time, so Laura. Very. So uh, another thing that I want to kind of along with that is I know there's sometimes conversations about making space and about stepping aside to create space, but sometimes there's a danger that like if you're in a position of power and you want to create space for someone who's not been given that voice and that power 
it's not enough just to step aside because then you just leave a vacuum. So actually you need to support those people and work out what, support them to understand what they need to take on those roles and those leadership roles. Um, yeah, and that it is that it's that um, giving that support. And sometimes as well, like I said, asking what people need, but also being aware that it's really draining. It can be really tiring for someone to say what they need. So if you're not getting, you know, as we said, if we're not, if they don't know what they need, then supporting them to explore and discover what they need to be able to take up that space. Explore uh, and discover, that's nice as well. Yeah, do some homework, do some research. Yes, and, and what Tarek says is so bang on about listening because everybody tells you everything you need to know about them the first time you meet them. And if you're not listening, you hear, you hear what you want to hear. But if you listen, they always tell you. So when I do mentorship groups and they go, you read, you read my mind. I say, no, I listened to what you said. You told me what you needed already, but you were just frightened to claim it. Do you, is, that what, is that kind of thing you mean? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, that. Yeah, sometimes it's it's that it is there. It's just then be someone who can then draw those things out. No, without really putting helpful. them on the spot. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And I think also, dare I suggest that sometimes if you have been used to navigating spaces and being smaller, it does take time to actually really accept and understand that offer also needs to be very sincere. Because you're asking someone to step out of a space, in a sense, which we've often lived in so much of our lives, to recognise it as an opportunity for expansion. I'm going to have to thank you guys. This has been an amazing panel discussion, so dynamic. Who needs coffee now? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, Tariq, Ricky.